Hello everybody, my name is Henry Blackburn and I'm your editor for the online worship which you are watching. Everybody is so welcome here and I'm just so glad that you're here no matter where you are, what time of the day it is, or the day of the week. So let's all worship together. I just love Easter. It's such a great celebration. It's a celebration. It's the most important celebration of the church. It's celebrating how strong and powerful and wonderful God's love is. People thought they could take God's love away. They thought if they took Jesus away, they could take God's love away. But they couldn't because nothing can take God's love away. That reminds me of a song. Bet you know it. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, 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 nothing can take his love away. God's love away. And do you know what I just found out? I just found out that Easter isn't just one day. Easter is another six weeks. God's love is too big to celebrate just for one day. We have six weeks to celebrate. And so if I am mad or worried or I can just remember that we have another six weeks to celebrate. It's great. It's still Easter, y'all. And nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can take God's love away. Isn't that a wonderful thing to celebrate? Today's scripture lesson is John 20, 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this to them, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any sins, they are forgiven. If you retain sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not there when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. This is the word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our story from John's Gospel takes place on the evening of Easter, and the disciples are in a real mess. 
it's kind of Jesus' fault in a way. I like the way Greg Lavoie puts it. Jesus promised those who would follow him only three things. They would be absurdly happy, entirely fearless, and always in trouble. Now, in the course of my faith journey, I've noticed a pattern. God calls someone to some great thing. Then there's the fear factor. God makes a promise. And then the person's left with the decision to make. So God calls people. Maybe one of the most famous call stories in the entire Bible is when God calls Moses out of the burning bush. Now, once Moses gets over the shock of a talking bush on fire but not being consumed, and once Moses and God finish with their introductions, God says to Moses, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. So he says to Moses, come. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. The disciples, these disciples that are hiding out on Easter evening, you know they could remember their call stories. Jesus calls them into the kingdom. One day Jesus is standing at the edge of the water at the Sea of Galilee. The crowds are, are pressing in on him. They, they want to hear uh, him teach. And so he, he notices there are two empty boats uh, just right there. Uh, the fishermen had gone out of them. They were washing their nets. And so Jesus gets into the boat that belongs to Simon. And he asks Simon to put into the shallows so he could teach the crowd. After the sermon... He turns to Simon and says, hey, let's go out into the deep. Out into the deep water, we'll catch some fish. Now Simon pushes back a little bit. We've fished all night. We've, we've caught nothing. But if you say so. And so they go. And they cast the nets. They caught so many fish that their nets started breaking. They had to call the other boat uh, to, to come help. Both boats were filled with fish, so full of fish that the boats were starting to sink. And Luke says that all of them, all of these fishermen, were amazed. They knew something was going on. They knew God was in the boat. And Jesus calls Simon. He says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. Now, it's a bit harder for us, isn't it? Like, how many times have, have we said things like, you know, I just wish God would show up in a burning bush, or I wish God would send me an angel. I mean, that's one of those, be careful what you ask for, because when angels show up in the Bible, it's usually a moment of sheer terror. But there is that feeling I think that we share. It's like, come on, God, just give me a miracle. Make it obvious. Chan and I, we had been feeling the call to foreign missions for some time. And it just wasn't clear. Like we knew something was going on. And so we were both uh, like, we're all in. God, just show us. And make it clear. We'll go wherever that is. Well, finally it became clear. We were in the middle of starting a brand new United Methodist Church in a suburb of Winston-Salem, Advanced, North Carolina. And God says... I want you to go to Indonesia. God calls people. It's what God does. And so God calls, and then there's the fear factor. <laughs> With Moses. When Moses realized it was God talking to him out of the bush, he hid his face. He was afraid to look at God, because everybody knows if you look at God, you will surely die. And then, when God doesn't kill him, he's still alive, uh, Moses learns that God's business is to send him back to the Pharaoh. He realizes that's another death sentence, uh, going back to Pharaoh. Moses fled Egypt because of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was trying to kill him. 
Um, also, the fear that creeps in with Moses in particular are these, these doubts. Who am I, Moses says. I can't do this. And, and what am I supposed to say to them? I, I can't speak. What if the people ask me your name? <laughs> so, God responds to all of Moses' fears. God tells Moses exactly what to say. And it's pretty good news. Uh, basically, you're going to get out of here and you're going to easily plunder the Egyptians on your way out the door. But Moses is like, what if they don't believe me? And that's when God says, throw down your staff. And he does And the staff becomes a snake. It doesn't say what kind of snake. I've always imagined like the king cobra. Um, I don't think it would have been a rattlesnake. I don't know. Some kind of viper. Some kind of desert snake. Moses is afraid. But what's really scary is God says to Moses, Now pick up the snake by the tail. There's the fear factor. So Jesus tells the disciples to go out into the deep. The deep can be scary, especially when your boat is sinking. But Simon, he seems more afraid of Jesus. He says, go away from me, Lord. I'm not worthy. I don't have what it takes. I'm afraid that God will punish me for my sin. Now it's Easter evening, and they're in a mess, and they're afraid. Are they afraid of what's next? Are they afraid that they're next, that the Romans will find them and crucify them just like they did Jesus? They're afraid of the future. They're afraid of the uncertainty. And what about Thomas? In my opinion, Thomas has gotten a bad rap. I mean, I really like Thomas. I like his commitment to Jesus. When when you read the Lazarus story in John chapter 11, and Jesus is saying, hey, we got to go back to, to Jerusalem. And the disciples are like, they're trying to kill you there. And Jesus is like, we're going anyway. And, and Thomas is resigned to it. He's, he's like, well, let's go with him and we'll die with him. I mean, that's the kind of love and devotion and, and courage. And when, and when Jesus is, is talking to them later in, in the story, and he says, I'm leaving, I'm going to a place, and you know the way. Well, Thomas is the one who's like, wait a minute, we don't know, the, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. There's this urgency to him, like he was about to miss the bus. Like Thomas just wanted to be with Jesus. And, and I think, you know, Thomas struggled with their testimony. Maybe he had the fear of believing in a lie. But I like his honesty. He wasn't going to say he believed when he really didn't. Chan and I were afraid with this call on our lives from God to go to Indonesia. I mean, we were in the middle of starting this new church. And, I mean, one of our fears was a fear of failure. How can we leave this church? It's not going to make it without us. There was a fear of going to Indonesia. The timing of this, it was 2002. And, you know, with 9-11... There was a lot of tension uh, to, go to, a, to go to a country that was 90% Muslim. I remember um, we were uh, in training uh, to, to go to, to Indonesia as missionaries. Uh, the Bishop of Indonesia had invited us to come and to start a new co- contemporary church, uh, English-speaking language in Jakarta. And the mission board uh, said, no, we're not going to send you there. It was just this last minute thing. It was a week before we were to be commissioned, and then not long after that, we were going to take our family. Um, Ross was three at the time, so we had kids from age 12 down to three. And when they called us and said, we're, we're not going to send you there, we went through every range of emotion from shock, disbelief, anger, sadness. We wept. But you know what? We also felt a sense of relief. Like, okay, now, now we're not going to die. But what happened after that was just this deep confusion. Where was, where was God now? Because it had been years now that God had been preparing us for this call to Indonesia. And now we felt in the fog. It was a different kind of fear. What are we supposed to do? It was this fear of the unknown. 
Now, God calls people. I see a pattern of the fear factor. We're afraid for one reason or another, but then there's the promise. God promises presence and power. God promises the Holy Spirit. With Moses, you know, not only is God proving to Moses the, 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 the snake that he picks up becomes his staff again. God's saying, I'm with you. I will be with you. But in addition to that, you can take Aaron with you, and Aaron can, Aaron can be your spokesperson. God provides and promises to be with us on the way. And it's the same with the disciples. They're, they're terrified behind locked doors. Jesus shows up to them in that place and says, Peace, my peace be with you. He breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit. At the end of Matthew's gospel, his promise is, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Now, you know, Thomas needed to see for himself. And to me, the beautiful thing about this story with Jesus and Thomas is Jesus knew Thomas's heart. And so he doesn't chastise Thomas, you know, kind of like the rest of us do, doubting Thomas. Jesus says, no, like, Look, Thomas, here are my wounds. Here I am. I haven't left you. Come to me. It's amazing. You know, with Chan and me, in the confusion, in the fog, we didn't know what to do. And what we leaned on were these promises uh, from the past. Like what we knew was that God would go with us into this frozen tundra. And we knew... Whether it was God's will or not, we didn't know, but we knew that God would use us. God would go with us, and God would use us, and that was enough. And, and then there's a decision that all of us are, are left to make. Moses could have said no. The disciples uh, tried to go back to fishing, but <laughs> God doesn't force it on us. Moses goes, and... For the people of God, it's the great salvation narrative. The people are delivered from slavery and into freedom. You know, the disciples, um, in the beginning, when Jesus was calling them by the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen, and then Matthew and Levi, all of them, this collection of, of people, that he, Jesus begins with this, this compelling vision, this dream of what kingdom life can be. Like this vision of God's love and, and God's kingdom. And they said yes to that. And they, they left everything. It's really quite remarkable. And now, they're in this hiding place. Afraid for their lives, in the fog. What are we going to do? And Jesus shows up and, and he says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. If you read the book of Acts, they went. Chan and I decided to go into the unknown with little kids, trusting that God would go with us, trusting that God would use us, and God did. The beautiful things that not only happened to our family, but into the churches that we served, and the, the medical community uh, that Chan served as a, as a medical missionary. God is faithful. Now, for us now, today, it's the week after Easter. What is God calling us to? And what's the fear factor for us? I, I imagine it depends on what it is that God is actually asking us to do, but I think in general we fear God's call, period. Like, we know it's coming, and... and I don't know, if you're like me, there is that sense of, I'm going to lose control. I'm going to lose the life that I really want, the way that I like it, the luxury, the comfort, the peace. Or we're afraid of the people God will send us to because that's what God does. God calls us to people. Now, I might not have to go to Egypt or to the ends of the earth or to some frozen tundra. But I might have to walk across the street and make peace with my neighbor. I might have to walk into the next room and make peace with my spouse or my teenager. What is God's promise? First, it's the promise of possibility. Like, 
nothing is impossible with God. And as we come to the communion table, we realize, I think with heavy certainty, it's not Jesus' fault that we're in this mess. We're the ones who actually caused it. We are really like Simon in that boat. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I am a sinful person. The only blame that we can put on Jesus is that he calls us to follow him right into the thick of it. In one of his first sermons, at least, that we have recorded in Luke's gospel, he says to his home church, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God is calling, and sometimes we're afraid, even when we know the promises. And we have a decision to make. I'm going with him. And I hope that you're coming too. Let us pray. Gracious God, you meet us in this place. And you know our hearts. And that is very comforting to us. You know that we find ourselves in places of uncertainty. You know that we feel like we're in this mess. Not only that our world seems to be falling apart, and there's so much pain and suffering and fear all around us, the division at every turn. But you know the the pain and the suffering and the fear and the uncertainty and the confusion that is, is in us. You know that we need your healing touch. We know that we need the hope that comes with uh, your resurrected life. And so we ask for... that we can trust you and that we can follow you into those dark and frightening places where people are and have your heart to save them and to love them and to bring them into the fold. We ask your blessing. We ask it in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.